for the announcement. It's an honor for me to close off the stage today. I hope you're still uh, a bit awake. I'm talking about my master thesis today. It's called Computer Aided Design of Advertisement Product Compositions. Uh, so yeah, design. I've never been that much in design actually. I mean, uh, you could tell in fourth grade already that I was never going to be uh, the next Picasso. <laughs> um, data science was more my thing. I did my bachelor in industrial engineering at the uh, Eindhoven University of Technology. Did also a big data honors program next to that. And uh, in the background, you see the f very first group of uh, students that started at uh, JETS. Uh, so I did my master, data science and entrepreneurship. I'm now finishing it up at, uh, at Greenhouse Group for my master thesis. And uh, for those wondering, uh, that's me. Um, so I'm now at uh, Greenhouse Group. Um, it's a digital marketing uh, company, uh, which has uh, five uh, digital marketing companies under it. So it's an umbrella company. Maybe you know some of those, but uh, uh, they also have multiple hubs. And one of them is the Creative Hub. And they make these kinds of advertisements. So these are products compositions for Kruidvat. Uh, who knows Kruidvat by uh, hands? Who also shops at Kruidvat? So the, the, they make a lot of these, and uh, the Kruidvat also has 930 stores across the Netherlands. It's even more than Albert Heijn. So uh, they make uh, 15 campaigns a week at Greenhouse Group. Not only product compositions, but also other advertisements, of course. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of room for to yeah uh, improve this process. Um, so you see these advertisements, for example, on uh, new uh, .nl. Um, but now these advertisements are still, for a large part, made by hand. So this is how the process looks like. Uh, they read the Kruidvat's uh, requirements. They copy a previous template. They sort the images out. Uh, they load them into Photoshop. And then they scale the images correctly. So a lipstick should be smaller than a mascara, for example. Um, then they compose them. So they make a product composition. Uh, they put a pancake on the corner of the composition, for example, two plus one for free. And uh, then, they, then they see if it works. They, they check if, if it feels right, and otherwise they change things around. Uh, then they apply reflection and drop shadow, and then they send it to Kruidvat. And then Kruidvat gives their opinion about it. And yeah, this process goes back and forth. So uh, I'm gonna talk to you today about composing the images. So um, this was the ID. Um, I needed to train some sort of model that takes these images, uh, sprinkle some magic on it, and make a product composition. Not only this sort of composition, of course, but also other kinds of compositions. And uh, yeah, so this was my initial reaction. Um, <laughs> I never even heard of an algorithm do, doing something similar like this. So uh, yeah. How do we start? Uh, as a data scientist, you of course start with data. So um, there are 200 compositions uh, were available in the data set. Uh, those were Adobe Photoshop files, but also the exported image files. So the .jpeg files. And the goal of using data is then to extract some sort of composition uh, design rules or features from the images to learn from. Um, so starting off with the Adobe Photoshop data, uh, you can try to extract the layers that are uh, actually important for the composition. So you remove the pancake and the background and the Kruidvat logo, for example. Um, yeah, so extract the compositions. But uh, those files were really big. It feels a bit weird to say it uh, because we all love big data, of course. But those files were really big. They were 1.2 gigabyte per composition. And they also had a uh, lack of proper naming conventions. So you didn't, uh, so you see here that there's a layer called shampoo, another one is called spray, uh, conditioner. Oh. But the others are not really, uh, yeah, they, they don't really say what's in there. So it's, it's hard to write rules to uh, actually extract the compositions from there. And also, there's not really proper tooling available uh, in Python. You, exam for example, have. PSD tools, but the functionality of uh, that uh, package is really limited. Um, so yeah, th th this was infeasible. Uh, 
this was deemed infeasible. Uh, we could also use the .jpg files. So to extract features from that, you can use some sort of transfer learning. So I used the VGG19 convolutional neural network with the weights uh, trained on ImageNet. Then if you remove the last layer, then you uh, still have to, you have the features and you can use those to uh, make, make an image. So uh, those uh, images are now plotted using TSNI, which is a dimensionality reduction algorithm. Um, but you can see that uh, lots of values attached to uh, similar images, but then uh, in attributes that don't matter for the composition. So you see the green background or the darker border or the, um, uh, the red background, of course. So uh, this was also deemed infeasible to actually extract composition rules from. Um, so yeah, how do we start? Uh, apparently not with data. So we need to find some sort of other solution. Uh, so we can try to incorporate designers in the process. So I'm now gonna talk about how we can learn from designers. There's a research field called computer-aided design. Uh, it's not uh, really explored much, but I uh, stumbled upon this research that uh, in which you can make a furniture layout using computer-aided design. So you can select a couch and uh, uh, two chairs, for example, and then it can create uh, lots of variation for you so that you can see what you like and what you eventually select. So a lot of these methods make use of genetic algorithms. So a genetic algorithm is a machine learning algorithm based on evolution and natural selection. So you can see that the animal in the middle can reach the leaves in the tree and the others don't. So the middle will survive and eventually reproduce and the rest of the population will then adapt to it. Uh, so what are the steps in a genetic algorithm? You initialize the population, uh, you perform evaluation, uh, then the selection, crossover and mutation. And I will explain that using a simple example uh, in the same uh, field. So you initialize a population of three. You see the, the panty liners packaging here. Um, then you perform some evaluation. So um, assume that you want to plot all the items on the, the bottom of the image. Uh, so this line, uh, it's, it's a really simple example. You can do this by hand, but just for, the, uh, for this example now. Uh, so you calculate the distance uh, between uh, the, the bottom of the packaging and this line. So you can see that the middle one is the best. Um, then you perform some selection. So let's say you uh, get rid of the, most, uh, with the one with the most value, so the least fittest one. Um, then you perform crossover. So these, uh, these two merge and create, create a child. So it gets the uh, items to the left from the middle one and the other from the top one. Uh, and then you apply some mutation. So you add some noise to the population. So for example, uh, these two, uh, you apply some noise to them. And then you repeat the loop until you find some satisfactory design. So uh, we did an initial experiment with designers. Uh, they get um, these components in the Kruidvat canvas and they needed to make a composition. And uh, this was the outcome of the designers. So they all created a different one. So there's not actually one solution to this problem. There's not one composition that actually satisfies designers. So um, we came up with a research design in which we uh, make use of an interactive genetic algorithm. And I'm ex gonna explain what an interactive gen genetic algorithm is right after this slide. Um, so we make a web application, designers use it, and then they give their feedback. And we did this loop four times. So they could criticize uh, the, the compositions that we made using uh, uh, our genetic algorithm, and then they could give feedback. Uh, so we improved the product four times. And then in the end, we did a pairwise comparison uh, research in which uh, five pairs of compositions are shown and one of each pair is a computer-aided design and the other is made by a designer. So uh, I'm gonna share some results with you today as well. So what's an interactive genetic algorithm? It's basically the same as a normal genetic algorithm, 
but then the selection is not done by uh, yeah some sort of predefined rule but it's user selection so some of these you do this for example 100 times and every 10th uh, generation you let a designer select uh, the compositions that move to the next uh, uh, generation So how can we learn from designers? We use uh, interactive genetic algorithms to let them steer the uh, the evolution in the right uh, yeah, way, so they they can find a, a solution that satisfies them. Uh, so, but what do we actually learn from designers? Um, the solution was implemented in Python using Deep. The genetic algorithms were implemented there, and Pillow was used for the image processing. And then we made a web interface. It, it run on an uh, AWS EC2 instance, and we used uh, uh, really simple tools like Flask and JavaScript. Paging the images is done by the top left corner. So you see that three bottles are pasted on the canvas uh, using this uh, methodology. And also the ones that, that are placed higher are pasted first, so that not, for example, the one that's higher get pasted in front of the other one. How do you initialize a population? Um, well, random. The canvas is 1200 by 628. So if you have, for example, have four items, then they are uh, pasted uh, between 100 and 1200 for the x-coordinate, or it should be 1100 actually, and then uh, between 100 and 500 for the y-coordinate so that they are actually not off canvas so that you cannot see them. And you repeat the cycle until the population is filled. So, for example, 100. Then the fitness of a composition is based on multiple components. So you loop over every item and you check its attributes, and the, those attributes are overlapped with the, with the other items. So it should be not too much, but also not too little, so that you see white space, which is actually the next attribute. Um, so there should not be too much white space behind the composition, because that looks ugly. Um, enough space to the bottom and the side, but also not uh, off canvas, so that you should see them. Uh, because if you add noise, they could spin off the canvas, of course. Uh, no floaters. So for example, if you have an extra item, it should not float, so that uh, it cannot fly, of course. Uh, and smaller items should always be in front, so the smaller jar should be in front, otherwise it gets covered by a bottle and you cannot see it anymore. So how do you select the compositions? Uh, if a user does not select them, you can use a, a method called tournament selection. So you select k individuals at random from the population, and you pick the one with the best fitness, and you repeat until the population is filled again. So here you have an example. You pick three random candidates from the population, and then you choose a winner. And then you can, um, yeah, you, you use those uh, winners to fill up the population again so you can get duplicates in there and if those cross over it will actually be the very same composition then crossover uh, you have a method called two point crossover so you have the two parents uh, those both have x and y coordinates for the four items and then uh, you create the children um, by uh, merging those two, like the genes from the, the parents to uh, create children. So you create two children now. Um, then a mutation, which is actually the most important part of this whole uh, application of genetic algorithms. Those are based on uh, component similarity, which was feedback by designers because uh, similar components should be grouped together. I will cover that later as well. And height difference. So. Uh, for example, the smaller jar should not be pasted behind the bigger bottle. Um, so one step of mutation is add noise to the coordinates of the item, so you can see the jar that is uh, going some other direction, um, or aligning two items vertically, so putting them on the same line, uh, align two items horizontally, so now it's actually in the back, but uh, for other compositions, just like the, the Vitreus one I showed you in the beginning, this could be a valid uh, mutation step. Uh, you could also mirror two items, so they get the same distance to the border and also the same distance to the, uh, uh, the bottom border. 
uh, connect them together, which actually has the most probability in uh, the algorithm I implemented, um, or shuffling them. So you swap the positions of the items. Then the web application, which is shown really shortly here. So you click the generate button, you select the designs you like. Um, you can also save them so they don't get uh, uh, removed when you generate again. Then you see some other compositions and then you can export one. And also visual effects are already applied here. So they don't have to do that uh, themselves, the designer. Uh, so yeah, th this is also what we launched every week and the designers give, gave feedback on. Uh, the loading time is a bit longer, but I skipped it through uh, for you. So the main learnings from designers, uh, uh, some, some learnings are not shown here. Um, align the composition in the middle. So this was a result of one of the first compositions. It's clearly not in the middle. Uh, it should be there. Um, you need to show variation between compositions. So in the first launch, a designer came to me and said, uh, I want to choose one, but they're all the same and I don't like them. <laughs> so uh, the children will also look uh, the same, so you can't get any farther then. Um, no floaters, which I also explained. So uh, components can go flying. Uh, and similar items need to be grouped together. Uh, just like in this one that the two uh, to the right are actually the same shape. So we used uh, OpenCV there to calculate the shape similarity so that they are grouped together with a higher probability. Um, so yeah, what can we learn from designers I just presented to you? Uh, now, uh, what are the results after four iterations? Um, I showed you this slide before, but now I swapped two out with computer-aided designs. So I numbered them as well. and. Uh, by the raise of hands, I'd like to know which one you think is computer aided or not. Three. So, who thinks one? Two? Three? Oh. Four? Five? And six? So, actually, one and three are computer aided. And the rest is made by a designer. So uh, for, lame, uh, for, for people that don't have a lot of design knowledge, the, uh, the difference is really little. But define, designers will actually see the result. Uh, the, we'll see the difference here. So uh, for designers, it's not really satisfying. But the, the result for normal people is already there. Um, <laughs> Uh, the next steps is uh, finishing up the pairwise comparison. So I did a little test already with 50 respondents and about 35% of the computer aided designs were chosen over the designer compositions. So that's quite a lot, quite a, a result already. Uh, applying the visual effects. So we uh, are working together with a software engineer and he already managed to uh, put some really nice uh, reflection on the composition, which is necessary for Kruidvat. And also uh, going live with this product. So uh, measuring the CTR on a, on a website like uh, new.nl, for example. So the takeaways from this presentation, um, start simple, do basic tests to find out uh, what methods are actually feasible before spending too much time on them. Um, test and talk. So uh, involve designers in the process of, uh, of uh, developing such an application so that you can get feedback uh, uh, during the development. And uh, also a bit weird on this conference, but designer first and data science second. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. It was indeed simply explained. Questions? Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I have a question about when it's different number of products in the picture, mm -hmm. your input size is different. Yeah. Do you build the same model or different model for different purpose? Yeah, you, can, you can use the same exact model for that. 
because it doesn't, uh, yeah, it takes into account the number of elements that are in there, but yeah, it scales with them. So you just initialize a population that is bigger. Like the, the genes in the population are bigger. So. Um, would you call this really a creative process? Because it seems you've just shown that what the designers do is not creative, it's just boring. Well, <laughs> to, to clarify, they also think it's really boring. So they, they allowed uh, me and my colleague to automate this because they actually want to try to, or they want to do other work like branding campaigns, which are more exciting than this work. Uh, is this whole process creative? Um, yeah, it's just implementing rules, but the designers can still steer the genetic algorithm in a direction they want. So they are shown a lot of variation, and from this variation they can choose a composition they like. And then also if Kruidvat doesn't like that kind of composition, they can swap it out for another one really quick. Mm -hmm. So have you tried doing this with customers choosing the ones that they like instead of the designers? Yeah, so the pairwise comparison uh, is a test where five pairs of compositions are shown to uh, an internet user and he or she selects the design he likes. But in practice, it's never the case that you see two compositions. But uh, with uh, what I said here, with um, going live, we're actually gonna do two uh, compositions by placing them on a, on a website, not at the same time, of course, and then measure CTR, for example, to see which one does better. Yeah, but so we'll follow up maybe, but that's still the algorithm that was trained by feedback of the designers. Yeah. So have you tried training it with customer feedback? Not yet. That's really something that could be for the future. What do you mean by random feedback? Uh, what the designers do, so the selection, the user selection process, mm -hmm. completely randomizing. R randomizing the selection process. Yes. And and what then? <laughs> get a baseline. Oh, get a get a baseline. Uh. I I guess what you could do is. Uh, put the population out there on an A, B, C, D, E, F uh, times 100 test, and then based on the click-through rate, you uh, give probabilities to different compositions to actually make a new composition. Yes, so you mean incorporating the CTR, for example, in the fitness function. Yeah, this could be done. But th this is really some explorative research. Uh, it's never been done before. Uh, it's also for my master thesis. So. Uh, this is the scope now, but we can also uh, extend it later. I was, uh, I was wondering if you asked Just the designers... Just for a second, if you, oh, sure. if you could, you can put the... Uh, turn it up. One, two, whoa! <laughs> okay, I was wondering if you asked the designers if the uh, algorithm gave them new ideas for designing these things that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Uh, didn't get that feedback yet, but uh, they are presented with a lot of variation. You could also see with the outcome of the uh, designers with the initial experiment, they all make a different design. So uh, whether they, some designers uh, gave the feedback that they did not find the design that they liked, but they find another satisfactory one. So that was some feedback that uh, was given. Any other questions? Well, I guess that's it. Thank you very much, Guy. Yes, give me a warm applause. <laughs>